So thank you very much for the introduction, Ivan, and thanks for the opportunity to take part here. And when I was putting this session together, I was really reflecting on uh, the great opportunity that I had to help Dr. Popovich bring together uh, this selection of articles from the Aspatar Sports Medicine Journal. In putting that together, I got the chance to go back through and read all of our journal issues. And obviously our journal now has been going for quite some time. And some of those articles that we were looking at at the time, when they were published many years ago, perhaps our thinking has changed now, some things are timeless. But it got me to reflecting on where we're going to be in about 10 years from now. And no doubt we're going to be looking back at some of the things that we think about now and think, gee, I can't believe that we used to do that. And some of those things are going to hold up. So in putting together this panel this evening for their talks, uh, what I've hoped to do is to try, or in fact, the instructions to all of these guys were, I want you to think about the practicing clinician in the audience. I want you to keep your talks nice and short and just tell them where the research can inform their clinical practice on a day-to-day -day basis. So since I'm putting the session together, I get to go first. And so we're also lucky enough to have um, use of the Aspatar jet here this evening. So we're going to get to fly around the world. And here, if I'm right, here we go. So what has research ever done for my hamstring or hopefully for your hamstring patients? So here we are at Aspatar this evening and the first thing of the three main sections that I want to talk about today when I'm reflecting on the mistakes that I have made throughout my career and the big changes that I think has come across over the last few years is I really think that we need to think about actually changing the tissue and some big mistakes that we've been making that I'll go through in these first couple of sessions. So back, well, close to 30 years ago now when I first started practice and really for perhaps the first 15 years of that time, everything was about static posture and there was some way that some tight or weak muscles or loose or overactive muscles would then influence the static position of different bones. And because of course we knew that basically human beings were exactly the same as cars, if humans got out of alignment, then of course there would be all sorts of problems to pay. Now, you're a lot smarter than I am, so you can probably see a few weaknesses in there, but we carried on with these assumptions. And so we took a whole bunch of different measures to check those static alignments. And unfortunately, it didn't matter what was wrong with you, what we found wrong, because everybody just needed some manual therapy and then an injection of gluteals and abdominals. Now, maybe that was a good idea, but unfortunately, the mistake that in retrospect I think we made was those injections of gluteals and abdominals were overcomplicated and underloaded exercises. And that's a mistake that I think we still make until today. And when you're doing exercises like that, unfortunately, in the presence of injury or in the presence of normal tissue, you're not going to end up with any hypertrophy or any meaningful changes in those structures. So any advantages that you give your patient are probably incidental to any of the treatment that, we're, that we were applying. So these days now reflecting on what is it that we're doing if exercise is the cor cornerstone of the exercise uh, of the management approaches that we should do. And we're absolutely spoiled for choice in the kind of exercises we can choose for our hamstring uh, injured clients. And the assumption has been, or what I'm seeing, is that the more complicated you make your exercises, then that, how some, that somehow makes those exercises more tailored and that'll somehow end up with better care. And I'm not sure. I think the jury's still out on that. I can't come down strongly one way or the other. And we've got a lot of speakers coming after tonight who's going to tell us a lot more useful things about exercise prescription. So what are the next mistakes we make? Well, we need to be measuring things, I think. And you saw we were taking a whole bunch of different measures. And of the measures that it, we actually can say they really do measure something, these flexibility measures were terribly popular. And I know I've spent many hours measuring static flexibility of different athletes at different times. And then now when I reflect on our athletes actually getting injuries, and these are genuinely the first three random hamstring injuries that I saw. So we'll see our friend here. There's a hamstring injury that he had. Now, perhaps this guy who just reached out, maybe you could run the argument that his flexibility or lack thereof could be somehow associated. But that's, I think, a, a relatively unusual case that we saw. And we don't even know whether the, the flexibility was associated with that. But this guy just here, again, 
where was the static flexibility or these static measures associated with what that guy was actually doing on the pitch? And if we had been smart enough to look back in the literature, um, now more than 20 years ago, this stuff had been investigated by guys who are a lot smarter than obviously I am. And they took these exact same measurements and then they asked these guys to go and, okay, they weren't playing a game of football, they were running in a straight line and running quite fast in a straight line. And how well, for example, did this flexibility correlate to what these guys went, did when they actually went and got out into straight line running? So this was their hip extension flexibility measure that they took and then how much hip extension range of motion did these guys show when they actually ran fast over ground. And it turned out there was a relationship between them. It was a weak relationship, perhaps because they didn't have enough subjects, but it was in exactly the opposite direction to what we tell our patients. That's what this minus sign means here. So the hip extension flexibility that they showed on the bench was negatively correlated with the hip extension flexibility they showed when they ran in a straight line. All right, well, perhaps flexibility's not been terribly much use, and we've seen a lot of research that tells us that, so maybe we're tossing that out now. And these days, everything's in the core, and core control and core activation. I could never remember whether we were supposed to be getting our patients to turn their hamstrings on before their glutes or their glutes before their hamstrings, but this is basically how we were assessing it in the clinic. Again, this had been looked at so many years ago, and again, by people a whole bunch smarter than me. Uh, we won't go through the details here, but I'll tell you that these guys gave themselves every chance of finding something correlated with something else by looking at a whole bunch of different measures and looking at a whole bunch of different outcomes. So they had 18 chances just by luck alone to have something come out, and nothing was significantly correlated in terms of um, abdominal strength. The strongest correlation that they got was 0.32, which means about a ninth or uh, about 11% of the variance was explained or looked at a better way, 90% of the variance explained during actual movements was not explained by uh, core control. So what's the mistakes that we're making currently that, well, that perhaps we're making these days, repeating the mistakes of the past? Well, nowadays we don't have to rely on bad measurements because we all have a supercomputer with a high-speed camera and so we can take photos of our athletes. And again, I just suggest a little bit of caution before we jump there. And this has been taught to me by a friend and colleague, Rula Kotsafaki, who's uh, one of the physios who works here, but really she's a biomechanist. And she's shown me that for a start, these measurements, so this particular guy here, we're looking at how bent the knee is, and this is the same athlete hopping as far as he can horizontally. He's doing about 10 degrees or 10, 15 degrees less peak knee flexion in one of these legs. I'll defy you to tell me which leg it is because I just can't see it with my naked eye. More importantly though, it's not the range of motion. So this is another guy that I've really slowed down to give you every chance to be able to see the difference. He's running over ground at about seven and a half, eight meters per second while we do this. And there's a difference in the amount of knee straightening that he's doing and it's only about two degrees but far more importantly, the amount of work that his knee is doing. So one of his knees, when he lands, he's doing negative work, he's absorbing, and then there's the propulsion phase. He's doing about a third or less work on one of his knees, both during the absorption and in the propulsion phases. Again, you cannot see this with your naked eye, unfortunately. It's not the joint angles that cause injury, it's the forces, you can't see forces. So it's all been doom and gloom so far. What do we take out of it? What have I learned that I've changed with my patients? And it comes back to the problem is the solution. The thing that we have to fix is the thing that got us into trouble in the first place. And in this case, by and large with hamstring injury, it's fast running. So fast running, and I'll, again, there's more talks gonna come up this evening which tells us uh, in much better detail about um, the exercises we should be doing. So I'll just concentrate on one here, which was done a few years ago now. And these guys looked at a whole bunch of different exercises. We'll focus on this one here. Um, the exercises that these guys did during the, um, sorry, during the study, they compared them to fast running on one of these treadmills, a curved treadmill. So all the different exercises here were, were normalized to how much activation they saw during fast running on a curved treadmill. As I said, we'll concentrate on this Nordic for reasons that will become obvious in a moment. And then so for all the exercises, we've got the fast running as this first bar, and here we're looking at the medial hamstrings, the semis. 
and the Nordic is probably the best activating of all of these and it comes up for the medial hamstrings to perhaps 70% but maybe as high as 100% of what's going on for the medial hamstrings. But you guys know that as far as hamstring injury is concerned it's not the medial, it's the lateral hamstrings and unfortunately Nordics are less than half of what happens during fast running, at least as far as EMG is concerned. So that's led me to realise that these functional, overcomplicated, underloaded exercises that we were talking about, and many of us have been really afraid of doing Nordics, sprints are miles ahead of that. And if you think about the lateral hamstrings, and that's the one that we're really interested in over there, well, Nordics are only halfway to what's going to happen uh, in terms of where you're going to get to ultimately with what you need to do for these athletes, which is run fast. So it's obvious, and I'm just going to labour this point, if you need to run fast, you need to do a lot of fast running. Nordics are about the halfway point. They're not something for us to be scared of, but they're also not the finish line. The finish line for these guys should be fast running. And most of our injuries do come from fast running. So for just the football players, the first couple of hundred that we saw, most of their injuries were coming from the players reported fast running. So what should we be doing in the clinic? Well, we need to get our athletes doing back the same amount of fast running, the same volume and the same intensity that they need to do for their sport. And how much is that? Well, it really varies according to sport. So if we take one sport, and I'm deliberately taking some really old references here because this information has been around for years. Australian rules football is, played, is a game that's played over four quarters. Uh, and during those four quarters, the athletes make a whole bunch of different movements. They end up with, if we count higher speed and very fast running, so above 20 and above 23 kilometers an hour, they're gonna average 1600 meters. But the devil's in the detail here. The standard deviation is 800 metres. So if you think preparing your athlete, you need to get them back to 1600 metres for that sport, it means you're under-preparing the athletes for half of the games that they're going to come up against. If you actually want to prepare them for two-thirds of the games, we need to add one standard deviation, 2.4K. Or if we need to prepare them for more than 95%, then we need to get up to about two standard deviations, and that's 3.2K for these athletes. Different sports, different demands. Football, and now different levels. High level international players do about a quarter to a third more high intensity running and more than half more sprinting than professional players of a lower standard. Of course, it depends on the position you play as well, and it probably won't surprise you guys who know more about football than me, that defenders don't do as much fast running as strikers, don't do as much fast running as midfielders. So the take home message that I get for you and before we hand over to our next speaker is you need to figure out what the demands of your athlete is and especially what those worst case demands are and probably frame that in terms of the amount of fast running that they're going to need to do.